Hello, and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Sophie Pollard, and you're listening to episode 158 on the new species of pterosaur, Cheoptera evansae, with Dr. Liz Martin Silverstone, a technical specialist at the School of Earth Sciences at the University of Bristol, and one of PaleoCast's own presenters. Today, we'll take a look at Liz's most recent publication, which was released earlier today by the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology and describes a new pterosaur species from the Middle Jurassic of the Isle of Skye. Pterosaur material from this period is extremely rare, and so the discovery of the Darwinopteran pterosaur Cheoptera avanzae, which lived during the Middle Jurassic roughly 168 to 166 million years ago, dramatically improves the poor fossil record of the time. We will also discuss what Cheoptera's discovery means for our understanding of Darwinoptera as a group, and of pterosaur evolution on the whole. As we talk about this exciting new species, pictures will be available on our website, where you'll also be able to find an archive of our past shows, organized by geological period. You can also find us on social media, and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi Liz, thank you for coming on to the show. Um, by way of introduction, could you just give like a short little description of your academic interests and your career so far? Yeah, thanks for uh, chatting with me, Sophie. It's a kind of funny thing being on this side of the microphone for the first time. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm Liz Martin Silverstone. I'm the currently the lab manager at the University of Bristol, and my background is in pterosaur biomechanics. So I did my PhD in pterosaur biomechanics and uh, pneumaticity at the University of Southampton. And then I've been at Bristol doing various things ever since. Well, I guess before that, I was also in Bristol as an MSc student. Um, but yeah, now now lab manager and not doing so much research. So it's really exciting to get to talk about some actual research that I've been doing. Wow. So um, how did you first come to be working on this specimen? And yeah. Yeah, that's a kind of funny story. So I went for a job interview at the Natural History Museum uh, for a one year postdoc. And um, I went through the interview and afterwards, um, didn't know how the interview went, but afterwards, uh, Paul Barrett, who was one of the people interviewing me said, well, you're here. Do you want to come and look at this pterosaur that we found in 2006? It's been sitting here and nobody's looked at it. Do you want to just have a look? And I was like, oh, sure. You know, I like looking at pterosaurs. So I went and had a look at it and um, he told me a little bit about it. So this was in 2017, just after I finished my PhD. And he told me, you know, they found it in 2006 and it has just been sitting there waiting for somebody to look at it. And I was interested in it uh, initially as a, oh, this is a specimen from you know, the middle Jurassic, and I don't have a lot of that in my data set for pneumaticity. Um, and then as Paul and I started talking, he said, do you want to describe it? Because nobody's working on it. And six years later, we're finally getting it done. <laughs> Great. So that's a long time in the making for a paper. Definitely. I am really, really happy that it is about to be out because it's yeah been a long time and uh, it'll be great to see it finally out in the open. Yeah. So could you finally give us a description of the pterosaur? What's its name, uh, etc.? Yeah. So the pterosaur is called Cheoptera evansae. And this comes from, uh, so Keo is, uh, comes from the Gallic name for the Isle of Skye. So mm-hmm. it's uh, commonly called Elana Kio, which means like Isle of Mist. And so we thought that was a, a nice, it's kind of like a misty wing animal. Um, and then Evansae is uh, named after Professor Susan Evans, who has worked at that locality where it was found on the Isle of Skye and in that kind of area quite significantly. And it's actually, without her, we never would have found the specimen because she was the one who pointed Paul and that group to go and look in that area for new fossils and that's how they found it so that we thought we'd name it after her for that reason. So there's a lot of people that have worked together to bring this specimen from being underground in the Isle of Skye to being in a box in a museum to having a paper published on it. Absolutely it was a big effort so I know the 
you know, as I said, it went back to 2006 and that was a huge field program that they had, um, you know, lots of people working on it. And it was from what I've heard from people who were there, uh, absolutely horrendous weather and <laughs> uh, like sideways rain every day they were out in the field and weren't really sure what they were seeing when they found it it was pretty poorly preserved on the surface and they weren't 100 percent sure what was actually in there um and yeah lots of people helped in that regard and then we've had a load of people help out you know since it was just brought back to the museum prepared uh described all of this it's it's really been a big effort Mm -hmm. um talking of the region where seoptera was found um could you describe, first of all, what time period is it from and what would the climate and ecology have been like at that time period in the area? Yeah. So it comes from the Bathonian, which is Middle Jurassic. So we're looking at about 163, 164 million years ago. And the area that it's found in is a sort of series of freshwater and low salinity environments. So you have um, kind of levels of mudstone and what it's thought is that that's typical of a closed lagoonal system with fluctu- fluctuating water levels. Um, and that's kind of what we're looking at. So something lagoon-like. Um, and we have lots of other animals around from the same time, which supports that. There's lots of, uh, in the same area, you get turtle fossils and crocodiles and also things like non-avian dinosaurs, um, Mesozoic mammalia forms, lepidosaurs there's lots of things also some like osteichthians and fishy type things as well so that sort of supports what we think about the environment yeah so is it relatively common to find pterosaur material either in that area or in that time period in general no and no so in the area in general um there have been a couple of isolated pterosaur teeth that have been found there but nothing describable. And from the Isle of Skye at all, there this is the second pterosaur to be described um, with a name and the third kind of significant, well, I say significant. The other published paper is uh, a single bone, so that's not that you know big of a find either. But yeah. um, you know, there's not very many from Skye. And from the Middle Jurassic in general, um, the other ones are a little bit earlier in time, so they're not as... Um, late into the Middle Jurassic, but from the Middle Jurassic in general worldwide, there are very few pterosaur fossils. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a kind of weird hole where we don't have a lot of fossils. There's lots in the early Jurassic, and then there's lots in the late Jurassic and Cretaceous, but the Middle Jurassic is really poorly preserved for pterosaurs. And this is a big problem because that's actually a really significant time period for pterosaurs when they were starting to... um, transition from kind of earlier small bodied tailed forms to these like larger bodied short tails so getting something from the middle jurassic is really exciting yeah what was the preservation of this particular specimen like and how did that compare to other pterosaur material that you've worked on or other pterosaur material in general pterosaur material tends to be poorly preserved um, because they had these really hollow thin walled bones they're typically pretty crushed and horrible. Uh, what's really nice about the Cheoptera specimen is it's actually very 3D, mm-hmm. uh, which was surprising because I thought it was going to be all crushed and horrible, but it's actually pretty well preserved what's there. Um, it's not a like beautiful specimen that's all nicely articulated it's it's quite disarticulated and it took a while to work out what material was actually present um but it's it's not bad compared to other places i i've been a little bit spoiled because most of the work that i've done has been on the sort of brazilian very nice 3d material so i know that that's not a very uh usual way to look at pterosaurs but it's it's not too bad Mm -hmm. so what structures were actually present in this fossil uh we have quite a lot of the skeleton we have bits and pieces from both wings so there's like a wing metacarpal uh there's two of them so we've got left and right and then lots of other 
bits of wing bone, some wing finger, some um, other wing bones. We've got parts from both legs. So there's, I think, quite a good femur and um, other bits and pieces. There's parts of both of the pelvis, so both left and right. Um, Unfortunately, in most cases, these are all incomplete, but uh, there are a few nice complete bones. Um, We've also got several vertebrae, a couple of really well-preserved ones, um, but unfortunately nothing from the skull, which I really tried hard to find, (laughs) but nothing yet. Is that like particularly rare or common compared with other material within pterosaurs or? Uh, I don't think it's that different. I mean, sometimes you find it, sometimes you don't. I guess (laughs) when you have something that's disarticulated like that, it's not a surprise that the skull might have fallen away somewhere. Um, But it's it's quite annoying. (laughs) It would be really nice to have the skull. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, well. Because I'm assuming that like with a lot of animals, it's quite important for like, diagnosing characteristics to make inferences about like is this something that we know is it something yeah. that we don't yeah definitely the skull is is quite helpful to tell um compared to everything else because i think most if you look at a kind of phylogenetic analysis i think i'm not a phylogeny person but most of the characters tend to be from the skull or you get quite a large proportion of them so it, it is really important um and i think for most people it they also think it's more interesting. Um, I like wings, so I'm quite happy to find just wing (laughs) bones, but uh, not everybody shares that interest as me. (laughs) Um, So first of all, what kind of situation was the fossil? Like, was it all like kind of in matrix? Was it something that you could get to, to actually study physically, or did you have to use other methods to observe it? Yeah, so when they found it in the field, it was on a boulder that had like fallen off of the cliff face and they had to cut it out so they could see a little bit on the surface and then they kind of cut down and around to get the bits out that they could, but all still within a big block. And then it had to undergo quite a lot of preparation at the museum. So Lou Allington Jones, who's one of the conservators at the museum, did literally thousands of hours of work on this fossil because it was so fragile um but the rock is so it's like hard in some places and softer in others and you couldn't just mechanically prepare it because then the fossil would break so she had to do quite a lot of acid preparation Mm -hmm. um which took quite a lot of you know put it in for a little bit take it out coat it really carefully remove the matrix uh, yeah, literally hours of that. And that got it to a point where we could actually see most of the material on top, be confident that it was definitely a pterosaur and see could see enough on the top that it was something interesting. Um, and then for me, I've done most of my work on CT scanning. So when Paul showed it to me, I said, can we scan it? <laughs> um, and you know, I'm I'm kind of more comfortable working on material on a computer in a with a with CT scans than I am with an actual fossil, um, and that was actually really significant because it let us first of all see all of the material on the top um, because we couldn't remove it from the matrix; it was too fragile. So you could see everything, you know, both sides of it, but then also we could see everything within the matrix that we had no idea was there. And that turned out to be really important. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's a great way to end up describing new fossils is to be the person with the CT scanner. It does help. Although at the time, I was not the one running the CT scanner. So I can thank uh, Tom Davies, my predecessor, for helping. That Actually, this is another reason why this is such an important fossil for me, is this was my first actual experience scanning a fossil, because although it wasn't my job I was really interested in it and Tom Mm -hmm. showed me how the scanner worked and went through it all with me and that was kind of my first experience running the scanner wow Um, and then yeah so like the first step of this branch of your career yeah exactly it's a kind of funny like I got to learn how to do modern things before that in another Mm -hmm. job I was doing but I had never scanned a fossil and so then I got to learn a lot more about scanning doing that and it's really a kind of nice, nice way of ending this story. Yeah. Um, so obviously CT scanning is really great, like 
as I know, because you've helped me with my specimens, my MSC <laughs> project, um, it's great to be able to like look at the fossils and like reconstruct them without having to mess about with glue or removing all of the stuff that people have put on them. Yeah. Um, but was it like, so would it have been completely impossible to, if they wanted to put it in a museum or something, would it have been completely out of the question for them to physically fully prepare the fossil? Yeah, it's so fragile that mm-hmm. to do that would just be... I think that you wouldn't gain anything from it, um, from taking everything out, because you just have to put so much glue and stuff onto it that yeah. it's, just, it's not going to look like the fossil anymore at that point. Um, so I think this really, with this specimen scanning, was the best way of doing it. What um, What were the major challenges that you faced? And was it like similarly challenging or more or less challenging than other pterosaur material or just other material that you scanned as part of your job at Bristol? It was a fairly challenging specimen to work on. Um, The blocks are quite dense and in terms of size they're relatively large for what you'd normally want to put in the scanner so I think in the end the two big blocks were about 13 hours each of scanning Um, and even that, uh, the contrast is horrendous in some places and you just can't tell, or I I did a lot of like squinting and playing with brightness, trying to see where bones were going. Um, and there's also quite a lot of pyrite in it, which really horribly messes up the scans and gives lots of artifacts. So it was, it's another reason why this has taken so long from when I first started working on it because it took after you know Lou spends thousands of hours prepping it that way and then I spent not thousands but probably hundreds of hours (laughs) doing it um on the computer so yeah it was definitely not easy and probably I mean I think that I use it as one of my examples in the things of it like in a lecture of horrible material to CT scan (laughs) so yeah not easy but (laughs) it's fine it was worth it yeah so tons of time with the scanner trying to work out how the hell to scan it and then tons of time with presumably a viso trying to work out how to segment it out (laughs) quite a lot of time with a viso I think yeah I I, uh, was a hermit in the lab for quite a while (laughs) (laughs) moving on to I guess inferences about the animal itself do you have an estimate of size or wingspan So we think it was about 1.2 meters in wingspan, which is kind of normal for pterosaurs of that time period Mm -hmm. and and that group. Um, So it's not not super exciting in wingspan, but, you know, about what we'd expect for size. Yeah. Um, And how did you arrive at that figure? Was it just like using proxies? Yeah. So it's kind of by looking at other closely related animals and if you've got a big enough data set of, you know, how long is this bone compared to wingspan? We've got mm-hmm. a couple of pretty well-preserved wing bones. So that's a, a good proxy to say what the wingspan was. Um, can you tell anything about, I guess, the situation that the animal would have been in when it died or like, you know, its age or, it, you know, anything that happened to it or... Nothing really about what happened to it or the situation, but we think that it was fully grown. Mm-hmm. Um, it had a little bit of, um, I don't want to say mosaic, but different bones ha- kind of told a different story about age. Mm-hmm. There were a few that were um, potentially unfused, but it's also unclear whether or not they were just broken versus unfused. Uh, whereas other ones were fully fused like we would expect in an adult so we think it was osteologically mature Um, maybe not it maybe it could have grown a little bit more but it's pretty much there um did you clearly you did find notable distinguishing morphological features because it's a new species so what kind of notable morphological features did you find this is one of those very technical things um that you know, as I mentioned, sadly, since it doesn't have a skull, um, that's where a lot of the features tend to come from. But one thing that we yeah. did notice is, uh, so it's a Darwinopteran pterosaur, which is mm-hmm. this kind of transitional-ish form between 
earlier ones and and the later pterosaurs. Um, so it has all the features of Darwinopterans, but then it has this weird kind of bony flange on the coracoid, which is like the collarbone, mm-hmm. um, and that has a very distinct morphology. That was actually the coracoid is one of the best preserved, and we have both of them. Um, and one of the best preserved bones that we have. And it's there on both and definitely an actual feature. Um, and that's something that we don't see in anything else, this like mm-hmm. wavy margin. And then there's also a depression in the ilium, which is part of the pelvis, uh, that normally pterosaurs just have a kind of straight across bit, but it, this has a depression that maybe is for some sort of muscle attachment. Same with this um, bony flange on the coracoid, we think also muscle attachment, but um, those are the very technical things that make it different. <laughs> yeah. So presumably some different things that would have possibly affected function, but probably not enough material to do cool biomechanics stuff on it. Unfortunately, not yet. I wish that we could, but you know, maybe I could, I would say I'd try to convince Paul to go and do another trip to Sky and find another one, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. So just have to wait you could if you had if you had lots of time would you try and essentially take another complete uh pterosaur skeleton put the flange on there and just see if the flange affects it in any way so you could try and work out what it was for yeah you could try and see um exactly what it would be doing um yeah, so we think it's probably the insur- insertion site for the sterno- sternocoracoideus muscle, which is one of those... Um, Mouthfuls. Yeah, exactly. It's one of the little muscles that attaches um, from the sternum to the coracoid, so it's probably related to wing movement or something like that. So I guess could compare it to other pterosaurs and see how that muscle size would affect things maybe that's something I can get a master's student to do in the future (laughs) (laughs) something that I definitely do not have time for but I would love to know yeah any master's students listening (laughs) (laughs) um so I know that you're not a phylogeny person and you've already kind of answered this because you said that it's Darwinopteran but how would it fit into the greater picture of pterosaur evolution and phylogeny Yeah, so Darwinopterans, as I mentioned, are this sort of transitional form. So in the past, we had kind of thought that they formed a grade. So it wasn't a specific clade, um, Mm -hmm. but they were sort of, you had these rampharynchoids or the non-pterodactyloids, and then you'd have a sort of group of between three and eight the big question mark in the middle yeah, of the graph <laughs> sort of species that that show this um sort of mosaic mm-hmm. like features where they've got some features typical of the really early ones like they have tails um but then they're more in other ways they have features like the more derived pterodactyloids like um a nasoant orbital fenestra which is one of those things it'd be really nice to have a skull for because this is mm-hmm. a in early pterosaurs, you have um, a bar that separates the two different holes in the skull. But in the later ones, that bar is gone and you just have one big hole. Um, and Darwinopterans seem to have features of both of these groups. Um, what Cheoptera has done is, and some other st- Papers have suggested this as well, but it's basically pulled all of those transitional forms into a single clade. So rather than being this sort of transitional grade up to pterodactyloids, you now get a sort of sister group to pterodactyloids instead. Mm -hmm. So what insight does this discovery give us into the evolution of Darwinoptera as well as pterosaur evolution on the whole? The other interesting thing that Cheoptera has done is it's pulled, as it's pulled all of these sort of transitional specimens into one group, it's also pulled that group much earlier than what we originally thought. So a pterosaur called, um, well, there's two, there's Cryptodracon and Alcaroin. So Alcaroin uh, was previously not thought to be one of these Darwinopterans. 
um, but is actually much earlier than Cheoptera. So this is where it's now put them into a single group and puts the sort of origins of Darwinoptera about 25 million years earlier than what we previously thought, which really changes how we understand that transition from the earlier non monofenestradins I'll just throw lots of random names in here. Um, so those like earlier pterosaurs up to the kind of pterodactyloids. Um, and then the other thing it's done is Cryptodracon was previously thought to be the earliest pterodactyloid, but this has now pulled that out of pterodactyloids and into Darwinoptera. So now we've got a kind of um, more wide range of what we thought of for the, this transitional group. So there's, it, it really pulls them to much earlier. So as I said, 25 million years earlier, and also that they had a near global distribution. So most of the Darwinopteran fossils before have come from China. There's a few from Europe. Um, and now we have Alcarwin is from South America. So with Cheoptera, Alcarwin, the Chinese ones, we know that this group is actually, you know, it's it's not a small group. It's something that is really making the evolution of pterosaurs much more complicated. If we have a more global distribution at this time, then it was really happening everywhere, which is interesting. Was there one other large group of pterosaurs at that time or like towards the end of pterosaur evolution? Or was there quite a lot of little ones? There's lots. So in the Middle Jurassic, there's lots of other pterosaurs that are still around. So, you know, at that time, we're still getting non-pterodactyloids. Like you get um, not too much earlier than that, things like um, Rampharynchus and that kind of thing. You're also getting, uh, you know, in the late Jurassic, during the Middle Jurassic, you get earlier pterosaurs and the kind of more derived later versions at the same time we're starting to get sort of them all together because it's definitely not a, a clear picture of you have early ones and then you have the middle ones and then you have the late ones it's it's all they're all kind of happening at the same time <laughs> <laughs> which I guess is a lot more realistic if you look at modern groups yeah we, we would like it to be a nice easy like you have these, and then they turn into these, and then they turn into these. But unfortunately, that's not how evolution works. <laughs> so the more complicated and annoying it gets, the better you're probably doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely uh, making things look a lot more complicated, but hopefully helping us understand things a bit too. Mm -hmm. Maybe. So do you have any further plans for Cheoptera or you know, failing that, is there anything in particular that you'd be excited to see? In terms of future plans, the only thing is um, we'd like to get a bit of a better idea about the age of the specimen. So although we think it is a fully grown animal, doing some histology uh, to really find out what that is, because obviously this would be very bad for us but you know if we were to find out that it was actually a juvenile um that significantly changes a lot of the things we've said about it so although we're quite confident that it's um an adult it would be good to just hit the nail on the head with that one um other than that there isn't really much planned with it um one thing that we think would be really great if somebody else wanted to do it would be to take it to a synchrotron and look at everything. Cause I think there's probably more in the blocks that we couldn't see. So when I did the scans, one of the blocks was so dense and you could just about make out some things inside, which I thought might be skull material because it was so thin walled. Um, we did a second scan at higher resolution and I could make out some vertebrae and the sternum, but couldn't really get anything else. And it just makes you wonder what else is in there. Yeah, Maybe with some higher power, we could see, I mean, I don't think there's a skull in there, but maybe there's something else. And I think it would be worth looking at that. Yeah. 
but it's not going to happen from me, unfortunately. Um, but I think it would be cool in terms of other things. I mean, I'd love to do something kind of biomechanics-y, but I, I just don't think there's enough material right now. Yeah. Unfortunately. But I think that it would be good to look at kind of close relatives. Nobody has really done any biomechanics on that group in particular. Um, so maybe with the combination of this, this one we have nice and 3D and CT scanned and other material we don't have 3D and it's not CT scanned, but at least we have more complete skeletons. So there might be some way of looking at kind of aerodynamics and flight and, and how it would work, but we'll see. Yeah. And then at least if you get some close relatives, you can get a little bit more of an idea. And also it'd be quite interesting. I mean, it'd be obviously very annoying if it turned out to be a juvenile, but then it'd be very interesting because you'd have a juvenile of a similar species. Yeah, that's true. There's there's several of the species, kind of the closely related species that are known from many individuals, including mm-hmm. different ages. So we do have a reasonably good idea of how they grew up. Um, I think some of them have eggs and oh wow, um, like Darwinopterus definitely has eggs. I don't know how many of the in-between eggs and adult there are, but I'm pretty (laughs) sure that there are a few sort of larger, smaller versions. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but has anyone done like any kind of um, study of function across ontogeny in any of those pterosaur species? No, and that's something kind of functional ontogeny is something that I've always been really interested in and would love to do more of if I had time and um, yeah I think it would be really cool especially in the the pterosaurs that have lots of different ages so there's a couple of bone beds around that have many different ages of you know going from you've got eggs with that have been scanned with skeletons inside so they can see what a you know unhatched pterosaur is like and then you've got hatchlings and then the there's a little bit of um things that like I co-authored a paper a couple of years ago um suggesting that hatchling pterosaurs could fly mm-hmm. based on some uh like wing loading and uh looking at strength of of wing bones and things like that but there's really not a lot it would be I think it'd be really interesting to do more of that yeah that would be so cool to read down this is this is me showing my academic interests in there, <laughs> but it'd be it'd be really cool to just see someone like actually map out yeah, logical inferences across ontogeny and then like so on and what it did at what age and maybe yeah I think that there's a couple of pterosaurs that you could do something mm-hmm. with but there's not too many that you actually have a good ontogenetic sequence yeah and then not much to compare it to in the extant record yeah unfortunately not so much to compare pterosaurs to living today <laughs> although people try <laughs> yeah <laughs> What is there still to find out specifically about the species, which I know is a lot, but anything particular that you'd really like to find out? I mean, it all involves doing more field work, but Mm -hmm. I think getting a skull would be really, really helpful. Um, I think other than that, there's lots of just specific nerdy pterosaur questions that you could do, but it's more like filling in gaps of what we know but I think that having a skull would be really helpful so you've probably just answered this but if you could magically decide what the next big fossil would be or you could just like ask like I'd like this fossil to be the next thing that we pluck out of the ground at the Isle of Skye what would you pick well if it's the Isle of Skye then it would definitely be a nice perfectly complete you know head to tail or not tail as it may be (laughs) um pterosaur but if it's just generally from a pterosaur point of view I think the best thing would be I'm gonna go on either end so either the first pterosaur because we still don't really know how pterosaurs evolved we have nothing and then or things that are kind of closely related and then we have fully flying fully winged animals but we have nothing in between so finding one of those things that tells us that's how it went from a uh, lagerpitid to 
a pterosaur would be really helpful. Um, or because it's really cool biomechanically, uh, a complete Quetzalcoatlus or something. Oh, yeah. Like that. <laughs> That's the other one. I want a giant, complete giant pterosaur. That is what I want. <laughs> That would be amazing. That would be like the museums would be fighting over it as well. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, that would be a a big one. So a throwaway question for the end because they're fun. Um, so if you could bring back one single pterosaur, one single animal, but you had to keep it in your home as a pet, would you do it? And if so, which which pterosaur would you pick? Um, I would definitely do it. Now I have to think about which one. If it's going to be in my house, it's going to be something small. Because it can't be a Quetzalcoatlus. Yeah. Unless you intend to ride it to work. Um, I mean, I could ride it to work, but I don't <laughs> think my dog would appreciate it very much. Oh, yeah? Um, <laughs> I think he would be absolutely terrified. <laughs> um, well, I think, because thinking of the size, I think it would work quite well. I'm going to go with Cheoptera, because it's... Yeah. You know, it's a good size. And it'd be friends with the dog instead. Yeah, exactly. It'll be nice nice and friendly with Merlin, not try and eat it, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> They're at least on like a semi equal playing field. Yes. Yeah. More more equal, I think. So yeah, that is all the questions that I had for today. Thank you so much for coming and being on the other side of the interview for a change. Thank you for chatting with me, Sophie. It's nice to be, yeah, on on this side. It's weird, but it's good. <laughs> Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall with Liz Martin Silverstone, Tom Fletcher, Nick Lupshire, Emily Keeble, and Sophie Pollard. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on funding from you, our listeners. So if you've liked this episode, please consider supporting us on Patreon, where you'll gain access to additional multimedia content, and thanks to everyone who's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs and follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.